Oh, kia ora. Greetings. Andre Whitaker here with another series of Legends of Legs, Mana Talanoa, and it's a pleasure for me to be speaking to a real icon, not only in sport and rugby league, a uh, person who played 50 games for the Kiwis, 20 of nine of those were Test, Belmain Tigers over in the NRL, but started off at the Mangere East Hawks. So it's a pleasure for me to welcome Olsen Philippina, Tina Kwe, and Talofa Lava. Olsen, lovely to have you here. My pleasure is mine, Andre. Uh, uh, you know, thanks very much for the invitation to talk on your show. Now, thank you. You know, you've, this wonderful book's been released and um, <laughs> authored by Patrick Skeens, which and it's a wonderful, wonderful read. We'll talk a little bit about the book. I've got a few um, parts in there that I've highlighted for us to talk about um, in this session. But let's let's go back and start with um, your whakapapa and family heritage. Where where is your your family and your Olsen Filipina family links are? Um, where does your heritage go back to? Well, on my mother's side, she's she's Maori. My father's Samoan, so uh, we were born up. I was born up at Kaikawe, and uh, you know, and my grand, my uh, mother's maiden name was uh, Remana, and my grandparents were under the Neho, and we were born up at Kaikawe there, around by Awarua, and all that. Mm -hmm. My father's Samoan, and his village is uh, Mangia, which is only probably about. Two k's away from the Samoan Airport. Well, look, and we were talking a bit earlier that um, for Pacifica Maori Polynesian people, probably growing up in the sixties and seventies, um, there was a bit of distance between um, learning and c growing up within your culture. And how was that for you? Was the um, Pa'asa more or the Tikanga Maori around your 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 family upbringing and, and your life as a as a young fellow? Yeah, it was good. The problem with the, you know, my father being Samoan and my mother being Maori, they had to make the decision uh, which culture to teach us. And unfortunately, with, you know, my other five brothers, we missed out on both because they decided to teach us English only. And, uh, you know, that was a uh, thing that we, well, that's, that's a major thing that I really regret and, and really miss out on, is that that decision they made because... Um, I'm still learning with when I went, Patrick started doing the book, which is the author, still learning on my Whakapapa side, on the Māori and Samoan side. But, uh, you know, that, that was the decision they made, so we basically went with it. Yeah, look, and I, I think that's a fantastic opportunity that through Patrick in the book that you're able to explore your, your um, more of your heritage and your background. So you, you came down from the far north and the I'm reading in the book that you migrated to um, to uh, to Auckland, South Auckland. Was it Mangere the first area that the family went to live in? Yeah, that's right. We migrated down to Auckland and shifted into a town called Mangere East, around Sutton Park, around there. And uh, you know, I think we were, I was about four then when we all shifted down there. And uh, it there's more opportunities for my father and my parents to for job, job-wise and money-wise, and, um, you know, try and give us a better life. So we shifted down there and we, you know, mother's house is still there. So my brother lives in it at the moment. So it's something that we'll always treasure and keep in, in, in our whānau and, uh, and all that. Yeah, it, it, it's fantastic. And um, that uh, the, the whānau is still there because in that uh, sort of 60s, 70s, was the urban drift for Māori and Pacifica into the city. For, for works either from, from the Pacific or from the far north, um, looking for work. And uh, reading in the book, they, it seemed like there were some exciting times uh, growing up as um, people, local Pacific people had jobs in the local factories and the warehouses on the construction sites. Um, but also, and it was really interesting to read in the book, it was a time of change for New Zealand where um, self-determination for Māori was coming about and it mentions leaders like Eva Rickard and who are challenging the injustices around land, language, and culture. Uh, and then also you have the likes of um, dawn raids going on and um, the Polynesian Panthers, which were um, uh, uh, coming onto the scene. What, what was it like for you as a Pacifica Māori person growing up amongst that? A, a lot of excitement, a lot of change, but also starting to feel the change in New, New Zealand society as uh, Polynesian and more brown faces were becoming more and more visible. Yeah, it was it was it's good to see actually because you know it, 
we started, uh, like you said, shifting down and migrating down there. It's like everything else to improve our, our lives for the, you know, for our family. And, uh, you know, as things went on and uh, got, you know, more of us down there, well, you know, we started uh, more or less establishing ourselves down there and people sort of knew, you know, we, we were going to be there for a while and, uh, and it's sort of like we sort of made it our own. And, you know, and it's just carried on from there. Yeah, so making it your own and uh, the Pacific community in Mangere migrated around things like the church and the sports club and for you it was rugby league. So let's talk about your introduction to, to rugby league at the Mangere East Hawks here. Yeah. yeah, well, you know, it was the, um, it, was, it was the club that uh, more or less started my rugby league career off and it was all over... Uh, that's where I put it a, a, ham, a free hamburger and a free bottle of Fanta that really got me, you know, really in, into league and everything else when I was about 11, 10 years old. And I, my parents had to work and all that. And even though sometimes they couldn't take us to training, I used to run all the way from home up to Messi Park, you know, what kind of weather it was. I just love the game so much and that's why I ended up doing things like that. And, like, you know, you're regarded as an icon of New Zealand Rugby League, um, actually International League. So for you, who, who are the icons and the role models for you as a young person coming up through Mangere? Who, who, who are the role models for you in Rugby League in Mangere East Hawks? Yeah. Well, you know, you had players like Joe, Joe Tucker and, uh, you know, Charlie Biddle and, Boy and the Beasleys. And all that, you know, players like Alan Popata, you know, I, that that uh, when I first met him, he, he was a. They had told me he was a bikey, and you know, well, back in South Auckland back then, you know, the gangs were sort of like the, the normal around there, and uh, you know, to him for a player like him, a guy like him, he, he joined. He was in the gang for years and years to play rugby league it was it was just unbelievable because he was so strong and tough and you know, he taught me a lot, he taught me a lot uh, about uh, respecting yourself and standing up for yourself, uh, you know, mm -hmm. while playing rugby league. And uh, all these guys I mentioned is, you know, they, they, they taught me when I was playing with them when I was going to school. I was yeah. playing in the, in the senior bees with them. And, you know, they taught me all this stuff about respect, uh, you know, your elders and playing the game and, yeah, it was just great, great learning process for me with these blokes. Yeah, look, you mentioned school there, and in the book it talks about the um, bull rush. That's uh, uh, is a place <laughs> where a, a lot of uh, uh, league players, rugby players, um, get their learnings, and you know, uh, and you 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 you, you took some of those bull rush um, uh, learnings. That I, I can imagine, you know, you're the last person to be called, and there's uh, 15 other people trying to tackle you. You know, yeah, that's right. Yeah, you, it's like, you know, were you using the, the sidestep, using the bust and that sort of thing in games of ball rush? Yeah, that's, as, that's exactly right. It's another way of improving, improving your, your, uh, you know, your style and how you wanted to play the game and your toughness because you had to figure a way uh, how to get around all the blokes that are left in the middle. And it's the same thing on the football field. Is trying to work your way around getting past the guys that were, you were playing against. Yeah, well, and it certainly served you well as, um, you know, obviously came up, progressed through to make the Auckland representative team and, and then on later to the Kiwis, which we'll, we'll, we'll talk about. But in terms of making the um, Auckland rep team, Carwell Park has a huge um, aura and um, holds a special place for people. You know, there's the Carwell Park diehards, which are, uh, you know, the likes of yourself, yeah. Mark Graham, you know, are, are big members of. What's, what does Carlow Park mean to uh, a league in Auckland when you're there and you're turning up for a game and um, the whole feeling and the whole atmosphere? It's, it's uh, that's where I put it. it, it's life. It, you know, it brings life, life to you whenever you run on that football field. It's just another, you're, you're in another planet because, you know, the fans and uh, that turn up, uh, top it all off. And, you know, it's a place that, it's like going to heaven, you know, and um, and the fans are there just cheering you on nonstop. It just brings, you know, it's 
it's a, like home away from home. It, you just can't beat it. It's very hard to explain because, you know, it, it's a very special place to a lot of uh, league players and mm. fans. And mm. uh, obviously that's why Carlo Park Dyers was started by Troy. And, and that's why it's so successful because a lot of people have got a lot of memories there. And, you know, it's like the field of dreams. Yeah, yeah, look, and obviously you had some huge games there for Mangere. I, I read in the book how Otahuhu, um, coached by Graham Lowe at the time, was always um, a big challenge for the club. <laughs> um, but then, you know, an iconic team. And then, you know, moving into the Kiwis, obviously some big games there. You made the Kiwis in 76, 77. There was an interesting part in the book where um, on an Australian tour, you were interviewed by a sports journalist and um, you're pretty much saying to him that football isn't everything, you know, there's more to life than rugby league. And they were, he was pretty much taken aback that um, someone of your calibre would be thinking about the holy sport as it's called in Sydney in that way. Um, but then you ended up in Sydney and um, in the book it talks about there's yeah. a bit of reluctance about going there. And in fact, um, you know, even the flight over holding on to your uh, ponamu as a, as, a, as a kind of way of good luck. So um, I'll, I'll just read a piece out of the book, actually, which to me, it talks about Balmain and Leichhardt Oval. And I, and I think it says a lot about um, rugby league around the world. So it says, um, Balmain was a, once a hard working class suburb and people lived for their fo football. It cured a lot of things for us. No matter what they threw at us during the week, we'd wipe it all away on the weekend and our spirits lifted, supporting humble heroes like Olsen, helped us survive. Um, that, that to me really captures um, the working class background of rugby league, and um, yeah. and uh, so for you, um, being amongst all that orange and black support, you know, it, it talks in the book about walking up Mary Street to the game, the security of cordoned off the uh, streets so that people walk in a certain direction, so it streets. builds a whole hum. And, and how would you compare that to your Auckland Carlo Park um, uh, passion? Yeah, it, it's it's very similar to to the Auckland style and everything else. But the difference is, is you know, I spoke to a lot of uh, rugby league players, Australian rugby league players, and and even supporters that were following the Tigers. That you know, all they lived for was and worked for was to go and watch rugby league every weekend, and every money they saved was always, you know. The highlight was always going to uh, SCG to watch rugby league, and and that was very similar to what a lot of people did at Carlow Park. Mm. So that you know it was really good to hear that. Yeah, look, and you pay some strong acknowledgement to that. That um, you're there to pay back the fans. That they're, they're buying the tickets. Yeah, um, you exactly. know they they're um, they're they're working hard during the week um, in the factories and the warehouses, and and their their one piece of relief to life is coming to watch the footy game on the weekend. So that must have been fantastic. But there was also a downside, which you're very candid about in the book, uh, around the racism and verbal abuse uh, that you faced uh, on, on first arriving at Sydney in the 80s, which was a, you know, a far different place to what it is now. And um, you know, there's still a lot of work to go. What, you know, a little bit about what was that like for you coming against that um, blatant racism? Yeah, it's... Yeah, you know, like, I was actually... You know, shocked because it's. I've never heard, you know, some of the names that had called me and uh, and everything else. So, you know, it, yeah, I was just shattered and I didn't know how to cope or what to do with it. I just switched. I tried to switch off and everything else, but it's. It was like every weekend I knew what was happening, and I had to try and figure out a way to uh, block it out, which I couldn't. Uh, yeah, you know, but that was, that was the way that things turned out and I had to cope with what I was abused with and everything else. So I just kept on, you know, as long as I played league and that's all I wanted to do and, and the fans were happy and, and I was still entertaining fans, well, that's all I was mainly worried about. And the racial stuff... You know, if I had to do something about it, what I really wanted to do about it, I probably would not, you know, be lucky the last two games of the season. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, but I couldn't afford to do that because of uh, money-wise and plus, you know, giving uh, 
uh, my bad name to my parents and yeah. and the Polynesians and all that because of uh, you know we've always been known to you know hit, hit first and ask questions later. Yeah. And so I didn't want to basically do that. And uh, Andre, and it goes back to the, the the promise that I made to my mother that I wouldn't get involved in the fighting. And uh, yeah, like I said, yeah. I'm glad I didn't do that. Retaliate. That, that was fantastic to read that and hear you talk about that too, and, and very candid as well. So appreciate your, your sharing there. Um, but also, I think reflecting um, uh, your commitment to, to, to non-violence about it, to um, uh, you know, basically showing them, paying them back with um, tackles and bumps on, on the field <laughs> was the way that you did it. And you know, you're um, a pioneer for Polynesian players in Sydney at the time. Who might have been some of the other Pacifica Māori players that had come over and were on a similar journey to you around the time? There, there certainly weren't the numbers that there are now, but who, who comes to mind um, back in those days for you? Well, you got you know, Henry Tartner, he, yeah. you know, he, he'd been over there and everything else, played there. And believe it or not, um, Teddy Goodwin who played for St. George. I didn't know he was, he was Māori and all that. And he played with St. George in the seven, early, early 70s yeah. and all that. Yeah. And then there was another player when I left in 98, played for the Tigers in 98, called Lloyd Martin. Right, he'd yeah, been yeah, there yeah. For, yeah, from what I heard, he'd been there for nearly about three years before I got there. Yeah, um, yeah. No, look, you certainly, um, yeah, we're, we're trailblazers for the many Polynesian players <laughs> that come. And, you know, we talked about ball rush and learning to bump and then the facing a bit of abuse and rather than using your fist, using your um, your body to break tackles and run. And, we're, and there's something about the Polynesian body shape and it's described a little bit in the book too. And we see it with some of the players that have over recent years in the NRL, I'm just thinking of players like Fui uh, Fui Moi Moi, who was at the Eels, um, and right now, Jason Tomalolo, uh, Steve Matai yeah. at, the, um, at Manly, and um, you know, right now, a guy that's uh, in, in recent times putting those big sort of runs and hits on Aiden for Noah Blake. Um, you know, we're, um, we're seeing a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot more Olsons throughout the... Um, yeah, you know, uh, throughout, you get the, the sunny, bills as, sunny Bills as well. Exactly, exactly, yeah. <laughs> you, know? But, you know, and... Um, you, you, you brought to the game and you talk about it, you had a license to be innovative and try things. And you mentioned Sonny Bull and, you know, his uh, one-handed over-the-top pass. Yeah. Everyone's doing it now. But um, probably wouldn't have been tried if um, uh, someone like Sonny went, well, let's try and be a bit different. Let's use our natural natural flair. Oh, sort of connecting there, there's natural flair, there's strength and power and, uh, and, and Pacifica and Polynesian players. And while we talked about the blatant racism that you, you face from the crowd and the media, you know, there's still elements of subtle racism that come from the media, which uh, I feel like to talk about Pacific and Polynesian players as having power and brute strength and kind of undermining and overlooking the leadership and skills um, and innovation thinking that you talk about that we bring to the game. So, you know, you were a first five and, 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 and the outside backs. You, you had to be a had to be a pivot. You had to be a leader. What what was your um? You cut out. That's all right. We got you back. <laughs> <All back. laughs> yeah, no, just just talking about your style as a leader on the field as a pivot. It's all good. All good. Your 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 style as a leader as a pivot on the field um, as the first receiver. A lot's been talked about in terms of the power that you have, but there's a lot of thinking and leadership um, tactics that you brought into the game. Just be interested to hear about how you tactically approach the game. Yeah, no, you know, that's our style of play, the, the Polynesian. You know, we play what's in front of us and we play, you know, on instinct. And I think that was the major difference with the Australian style of uh, rugby league, whereas they are like more or less like robots. You had to keep, yeah. the, keep the ball and everything else. So like, you know, we're, we're, we're free. We love the, love, love the flowing game. And, um, and that's the way... You know, like you said earlier, with the study bills of the unloading, and and you look at the game now, Andre, how entertaining it is because of the Polynesians and their style. You know, and you, you know, like I said on a few interviews, you know, you said white men can't jump. You look at them now; they're doing the tries, they're scoring is yeah. exactly the same as the poly poly boys are doing. You know, yeah. and the crowds are loving it. It's more entertaining, and and the offloads, like you said, that. They're learning how to do all that, all that stuff and everything else. So it's 
both codes, the, you know, the Parkers and Aussies as well are learning uh, our style of uh, scoring tries, unloading and everything else. And on, on the Polynesian side, on our side, you know, our fitness is, is the main thing that I think that a lot of us uh, are improving on. Like, we love playing the game, but when it comes to training, uh, no, nah, pass. You know, we come up with these injuries and everything else. Yeah. If we're going to go for road one or we're going to go do uh, four four hundreds or something, uh, you know, uh, and, and we're, we're getting there. And well, we're more or less there now. And yeah. this is why you see the Tamalalos and all that, you know, actually getting the big money they deserve. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that's fantastic to see too. Um, uh, we see excitement and flair. Um, we're matching it up there in, in every aspect of the game, um, leadership, power, and, yeah, and exactly. fitness as well. And fitness yeah, as well. That's it. Yeah, we've brought another um, level to Australian rugby league. Well, for you, you know, um, you were the pivotal person. Um, I'm going to go to the 85 Test Now series. And, um, you know, you, you were there, and I'll just turn to the book, and in the chapter, that's chapter seven called Kingslayer. And I'll just pull a bit out, bit out here that, that, that's in here, and it's in reference to the first test. And it says, the dressing room doors burst open at the first test in Brisbane, and the Kiwi players roared out of the players' tunnel looking for blood. The Land Park crowd was deafening. Everything was set. Graham Lowe had drawn into me time and time again that if I could contain and raffle Wally, uh, we would break them. I had my eye on Wally and he didn't look at me. I knew it was my night. So we'll, we'll just briefly touch, we're going to talk about that three test series. So that, <laughs> that first test, um, what was your thoughts there? Um, knowing that um, Graham Lowe had given you the, um, uh, the word, the orders that you had to contain Wally, what was going through your mind? Well, you know, I you know, come up against the world's best player I, I just had to figure out something and what to do and everything else. But Lowy sort of made it a bit easier for me because he had uh, told me that he had gone to see my mother it, before the test match and said, um, he, that said I'm, I'm going to pick him in to mark against Wally Lewis. And uh, he had told me that your mother said, yep, you, that she had said, yep, yeah, he'll, he'll do you a good job. If he doesn't, I'll clip his ears. <laughs> so, you know, it, when he had told me that there was sort of like, uh, yeah, you know, it really, really topped me off with confidence and yeah. everything else. And another episode that uh, made me play so well in that test series was the incident that I had um, after the test, first test match with Wally yeah. Lewis. I think that's in the book when he had uh, refused to shake my hand. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and it was a highlight for me to actually m to to meet the bloke. But uh, yeah. when he had done that, well, you know, I I decided to, yeah, take things in my uh, <laughs> own hand. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. You know, well, and do what I did. Well, that, well, that's right. And we did see that through the test. And so for that first test, um, you know, team was up 2014 at half time. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, in uh, you know the dying minutes, John Rebo um, scored, and it was a 26-20 uh, um, win to um, to the Kangaroos. And I will remember I was watching this game at home as the, the whole of New Zealand was engaged by that 85 um, uh, team and rugby league uh, series. And you know, I think a crucial part is mentioned in the book: Mark Graham being taken off, and I can clearly see now the replay of Noel Cleal taking him, taking him out, taking him out high without the ball. That's and right. Brutal, actually. And um, we all know the sort of tough guy that Mark is. So, he, you know, it was something that really caught him that um, meant he had to um, uh, be taken off the field. And, and, of course, Kevin and the Greek Dowling incident, which is, uh, is legendary. And also, as we found out through the book, um, was racially um, sparked earlier on in the game. Sparked. So, yeah, yeah. Um, and some yeah. interesting words from Kevin and the team there about when it all, if it all fires up, I expect to see you all backing me up. So, um, well, yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it, that was the thing with, with KT, you know, he, he um, you know, when he wanted to fire things up, he'll fire, fire things up. I remember a test series, I think in 84, when we had won 3-0 against Great Britain, uh, first time in 30 plus years or something, Andre. 
And before we walked out, he had called the Ford pack in and he said, look, about the first five minutes or first scrum, I said, one of the pommies here is going to start, we're going to fly out of the scrum because he's going to punch it. And he said to the Ford pack, he said, right, as soon as that happens, I said, I want you guys to hit one of the pommy forwards. I said, if you don't, I'll hit you myself. And everyone just sort of flights and, you know, so, yeah, yeah when, he, when that happened, it, yeah, it all started. So they, the blokes knew if they didn't hit anyone, JT was going to hit him. So that was, yeah. that's how tough he was, you know, and everything yeah. else. And it's just a, a great man to play with and oh, have on a- side. Absolutely, absolute legend. And, you know, you'll go to war with him. That Kiwi team, as I was saying, the 85 team, was winning the hearts and the minds of New Zealanders in a, in a rugby crazy nation uh, where everything's about the All Blacks, um, TV, um, schools, um, exactly. uh, rugby dominates everything. But he was rugby league coming through and actually winning the hearts and minds of New Zealand. So I'm uh, moving on to the second test and a, a bit that I've pulled out of the book here in Chapter 7, The Kingslayer. Uh, it says, for the first time in 75 years, rugby league seemed to have the upper hand in public relations as the All Blacks played poorly and only just managed to beat the Wallabies. Um, so, yeah, going into that second test at, at Carlow Park, and when we know the team only just had the game taken away from them in the first, first test. And um, the public relations that, um, that Graham, uh, Graham Lowe had with the team was legendary. He had, you know, uh, clapping to the, to, to, to the crowd before and after the game. And... Thinking about Rugby New Zealand, uh, Rugby Union, and uh, they were starting to acknowledge the game. And I will remember a rugby journalist, I forget his name, and he was talking about the All Blacks. And in one of his quotes, he said, we've got the best back line in the world in New Zealand. They just all happen to be playing rugby league. And he was referring to um, uh, Clayton, yourself, Fred Arkoy, and James Wu Luwai in the back line. So, Fred, what was it like in that... With that backline, and uh, you know yourself, Fred and James Samorn, uh, was that sort of Pacific Brotherhood going on there in, in, in that backline back in '85? Yeah, it was. It was the best backline ever, like you said, that I've ever played with because of that. You know, we had played together for a while, and we had that Polynesian flair and, and connection, and we knew each other's play that well. That's that's why you know, we um, it was so successful that year, that 1985. And you know, like I said, James knew exactly what I could do, and and that showed up a few times uh, in the Test match. Whenever I I broke, you know, broke the tackle, the whole team knew what I could do and everything else. As long as they let me do my thing, and then they, you know, I turned and there was always James or someone yeah. else, Howie or someone else backing me up. It was that uh, connection we always had when we got together, and it was the you know, you, you talk about. Uh, the All Blacks, you know, taking the limelight all the time. But that that year, that series was just unbelievable. That you know, I think rugby league made the the front page yeah. for the first time in a in a long, long time. Yeah, that, that's right. And, and certainly, as leagueies, obviously, we're very, very proud. And and, and again, being Pacifica people, you know, our, we we grew another foot when we um, taller when we saw um, the Kiwis played and. People of Pacifica background getting the mana that they deserve in terms of recognition, um, the skills that they bring to the game. Uh, but unfortunately, that game too, it was stolen in the night, last 90 seconds. <laughs> and I, again, I will remember um, it was Wally uh, who, who, you know, who carted the ball across field, picked up Gary Jack, who was running wide, and Gary connected with John Rebo. And that John has Rebo. in the book too. Yeah. You can just see the um, elation and relief in Wally. He was on his knees after the game, going, hell. We only just got that. So um, the team was hurting after that. And so, so were we as supporters in, in New Zealand watching and feeling for the team. So, um, you know, there's, there's the third test, which was coming back at, um, at, Carl, at Carlo Park. Uh, and I've just tagged in Chapter 8, which is called Deliverance, referring to that last game, and just reading out um, one of the passages here. It says, Kiwi's hard man, Kurt Sorensen, will never forget. Uh, this is talking to the Queen Street March of the team. We got out and started walking slowly and it felt a bit strange. At the time, I told Olsen that we might need helmets if they throw stuff at us, but it felt like the whole city was on our side. So he managed to, he managed to inspire a whole city. In fact, he inspired a nation to come out and support, um, support rugby league. 
And, you know, it was one of the master strokes by Graham Lowe in terms of building um, uh, teamwork and, and getting getting support, that man management. Yeah, and getting, our, getting that comrade, uh, comradeship back, back uh, and our confidence back with each other. You know, it, uh, like I said, when he, we pulled up there on the, on the bus and he said, get out, no one, you know, no one moved. <laughs> yeah. It's just like Kurt said, he said, oh, we're going to get things chucked at us because we had lost the second test. And then Lowy's, you know, we, you can tell the difference in his tone of voice when Lowy says something, really means it and how serious it is. And he, that second time he said, he said, get out of this bus now. And we knew we had to get out of it. <laughs> and then we got out of it and we got, and, you know, we didn't want to, no one started walking anywhere. And he said, why is guys start walking? And then we started talking amongst ourselves going, oh, you know, the helmet, we sort of brought, <laughs> sort of brought that. <laughs> I said, we've got to get hurt before the test match starts. <laughs> yeah, well, and, you know, and, and in fact, obviously it was the exact opposite that, that everyone, the whole of New Zealand warmed to the team. And I love and mentioned again in the book, Lowy's masterstroke of understanding the cultural background of the team and how he would speak to the team. And then right down to, you know, there was the first day before that match, um, the team went for a boil up and one of the other players brought their family in to provide family. The food and just yeah. brought that whole whanaungatanga into the team. That's it. And, yeah. it, you know, it made, it, it made a great difference to the side. You know, yeah. when... Uh, with the Queen Street and, you know, you had scaffold, you guys on scaffolding coming out and officers and yeah. all you could hear is the Kiwis are here. And I'm going, wow, yeah. this is, you know, it's like, it's not happening, you know, considering what we thought would, would be. And, yeah. you know, and that was the confidence that we really needed and, uh, you know, get back to the, the, our family grassroots, you know, with yeah. the boil up and everything else. And, and where we are from and, and uh, you know, connecting us all together again. And, uh, and the crowd did that and having the boil up and everything else when they're bringing their whanau in, did, did that for us. Uh, and, you know, uh, the third test result, you know, sort of proved, proved the, uh, you, know, you know, that That's because, right. because of that. You know, well, you know, you personally went out there and, you know, we all remember you running over, you know, Wally Lewis. Um, the, um, again, you're talking about that intuition between you and the outside backs looking and there's James on the inside yeah. or picking up Mark Graham. So but what was it like? The end of that game, that was the one where you, you, it was payback time or was deliverance as it's talked about in the book. And then, um, you know, winning that game and at the end of that game leading up to the haka in the, at, at, um, at full time. But it's just an experience that I'll never forget because, you know, it wasn't just a team effort. It was a New Zealand, uh, New Zealand effort, you know, from the spectators to all the, the you know, I go back to the, the builders and the fans that were out in Queen Street. It was all for them and, and all cause of them and everything else. Why well, I, I think we ended up winning, uh, you know, 18-0. That's right, yeah, yeah. And... You know, that uh, to me and to every, the whole team is, you know, you brought up earlier about going across and applauding the crowd and everything else, uh, you know, because it brought us back to, you know, where it all started and, and what it really meant to a lot of people and a lot of fans. And, yeah. uh, you know, we're glad we delivered it on that day and, it, and, and the result couldn't even be better for us. And we were just so relieved because... Uh, you know, everything that Lowy had done and uh, the fans had done for us and turned out on their numbers and that we and we repaid them with a, a victory that, you know, they all deserved. Yeah, it was fabulous and, and fantastic um, um, era for the game. Look, this, this, this book is an incredible read and um, it's more than sport. Uh, it's obviously about rugby league and I'm really fascinated and, and great work by Patrick Skeen in here that looks at the politics of the time um, what was happening in the communities, adversity, um, communities um, needing to deal with the diversity that's coming into sport. But um, sport reflects community. So, uh, you know, when we see things like um, people being racially abused and responding with non-violence, that's the kind of stuff that builds nations. And I think it reads very well in this book. Um, you know, it even goes to talking about um, 
our Pacific people as Polynesian explorers of the Pacific, as wayfinders. And and for you, Olsen, you know, you're a wayfinder and a pathfinder for um for Polynesian people in, in the NRL and in, in rugby league uh, that we're all very proud of. Look, um, I just want to read on the on the back page, um, uh, the back cover uh, from Sir Graham Lowe. He said, Olsen was a pathfinder, the first to show what Polynesians could do. And he was the face of hope for his community. He was a great player who was misunderstood. And this is a very important book to explain his role in the Polynesian rise in rugby league. And um, look, I, I just want to um, congratulate you on, on firstly your awesome rugby league career. Thank you for sharing um, candidly, um, you know, some some personal moments for you and your journey, and sort of the fun call you will tour around um, that league brings. And uh, con congratulate you and, and 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 Patrick on this book. And for people that are watching um, Manatala Noa, look, it's available. It's out there. It's at Whitcalls or Paper Plus. They're a national chain across New Zealand. Um, I'm sure if you're in other parts of the world, you can find it and get it on online. It's only $39.99. Um, it's a great buy. If it's, a, if it's the only book you buy this year, uh, it covers a lot of stuff. Um, so um, thank you, Olsen. Uh, and just like to thank you for your time on Manatala Noor Legends of League today. Thanks thank you very much, Andre, for having me on the show. It's a pleasure. Thank you.